thank you so much for coming to my conversation. This is a guided conversation. Um, my name is Kisa V. Johnson. Um, I am an MDES, uh, which means that I'm a master of design. Uh, and I'm here to talk a little bit about who I am um, and my design practice, which is called Design of the Living, Food, Farming, and Cultural Ecology. I always like to start off with a quote to give like a basis of like why I'm here. And it is so pleasant to know that in color and form and features, we are related to the first successful tillers of the soil, to the people who taught the entire world agriculture. And that's Frederick Douglass from 1873. So a little bit about who I am, like I'm gonna start off with my acknowledgements. I'm gonna talk about my, uh, design philosophy and, and probably my design values. Um, I'll talk about the different methodologies that I use um, and I'll show a couple of examples as we go in and we start talking about the future a little bit. So um, I always like to start off with my ancestors talking about the the, the, the godfather, the father of regenerative agriculture, um, uh, Dr. George Washington Carvey himself. Um, uh, my eco leadership uh, class knows that I had a humongous crush on this man growing up. I discovered a book about him in fourth grade, and I kept telling my mother I was going to marry him. And she was like, baby, he's not living anymore. I was like, what? And then I, I still was just like, I want, I want to marry somebody like him. Um, thus to know that I did not quite know at that time and space that I would actually um, become um, a cultural ecologist myself. Um, I also like to give a shout out to um, uh, Henry Blair. Um, he owns the second patent um, for the corn and cotton invention um, that, helps, that has helped transform uh, what we see as modern day agriculture. I also like to give um, thanks to Booker T. Washington, who, who created what we know is now today is called the CSA. We have CSAs all across farming, all across the United States, in various different cities. And that was due to um, um, the ingenious thought and strategy of Booker T. Uh, Watley. Um, I like to also give hail and thanks to the Queen Mother of Food Sovereignty and Food Justice herself, which is Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, not only was she a political strategist, but she was a nurturer, a cultivator. Um, she felt that home ownership, shared land, shared um, uh, student uh, scholarship, and providing vegetables were not only the most important thing to help us grow as individuals uh, within this space, but it was also a protective measure for black and brown people living in America. Shirley Chisholm, I'd like to give thanks to her and her husband, who um, uh, uh, Shirley and Shirai, uh, the Shirai's, because they helped bring the thought of community land trusts um, within the United States, within the black communities. Uh, uh, community land trusts are very important. If you can tell that there's been a lot of land theft uh, uh, amongst black and brown people for um, over a decade. Um, I also like to give a shout out to farming cooperatives. Although farming cooperatives wasn't um, a model that was created within the United States, um, but it was a form of modeling for black and brown people within the United States um, to be able to actually be human beings within spaces, to be able to uh, nurture themselves as individuals, um, nurture being successful, nurture um, being able to raise your family within safe spaces. And so farming was a huge part of that. Um, I also like to give um, thanks to the Federation of Southern Cooperatives because this is a, a, um, a very specific cooperative that is very deep within agriculture self-determination, which is on a regional scale. Um, it came out during the civil rights movement, like similar to like the MLK Poor People's Campaign. Um, but the emphasis was just not just on food, but it was here to talk about voting rights, it addressed economical injustice, lack of jobs, and disparities, but it also uh, pushed forward for self-determined econ um, economics and businesses. 
Uh, another organization, which is Detroit, um, which of course is Michigan based, is the Detroit Black Food uh, Security Network. Um, I really enjoy working um, with this group of people because they draw on the past and they understand what a full sovereign future actually looks like. Um, a lot of individuals, what, what we may not understand within the Midwest, there was a lot of migration that happened from the people from the South and those descendants came to the Midwest to kind of keep catapulting that dream. Um, uh, in Detroit was specifically, there was issues around white flight um, due to the civil rights movements, and then uh, uh, several uh, injustices that happened uh, within that space. Um, but this organization is all about food security and, and food sovereignty, and I like to give thanks to them as we go about. And none other than Cleopatra herself, uh, she was a Black agrarian as well. Um, she knew that the earthworm was the most important thing on this earth, and she also declared that anyone who touches the earthworm would be subject uh, to her, um, her vengeance. So earthworms were, were protected, and you can see how the ecological base of like is not only about humans, but it's also about all living things that are around us that are important. So, uh, Let's talk about my design values. And I like to always go to that know thyself. Um, a lot of how I function and form comes off of understanding who I am as a black person within this space and how Africa is very centered in, in me understanding who I am. I grew up on the shores of Lake Michigami, uh, which is on Lake Michigan, I'm right over there across the thumb, I, I'm at the end of 96, if people understand what 96 is within Michigan base. Um, so the water is quite moving for me. Um, I grew up in a, a very small town that was culturally centered. I grew up around a lot of sciences, technology, ecology, economics, politics, values, and arts and culture in this very small uh, black centered space. I was influenced by books and theater and art and technology, as well as design and um, African um, psychology. Uh, me growing up in the theater was specifically important to me, and I grew up in the Muskegon Front Thaw, uh, has a lot of culture uh, within that space. Um, because I was so much into theater, my grandfather, he would buy me books. Um, that was specifically based within, um, you know, folklore or uh, Black theater. He wanted me to know more about Black plays, if that was something that I wanted to do. And so I, I became really, really immersed um, in theater as a form of teaching, um, not just art. But art, to me, does a lot of teaching. And so, like, <laughs> as a designer, I never want to uh, lose my artistic path uh, along the way because I feel like it pushes me uh, to think differently and outside the box. Um, again, a lot of art and science. I uh, graduated with a bachelor's in media information from Michigan State University. Um, um, and I, I, I was really into serious game design. Um, I wanted to go into a, a master's program, but I didn't feel like they were like my tribe or, or uh, I, I didn't feel like uh, in, in, uh, that I was getting anything out of that degree. And so I just went ahead and graduated with a graduate certificate and took some time um, to work and to figure out like what I really wanted to do in higher education. And so here's my story. <laughs> So I started working as a learning designer and I took like standard courses and I would use a shadow curriculum to create levels of authentic, engaging, experimental and immersive experiences. I was a part of the system yet subversive to all its functions. I was more like an anomaly. And I was always told um, from my administrators working in academic technology spaces um, out of fear, um, you are only the title that we give. Um, but I'm not. I was so much more than that. And so I became like a navigator of the system. And I kind of started reorganizing it um, to create like more healing spaces versus how things were being broken along the way. 
And so I became what you call an agent provocateur, like an avant-garde thinker. And what I did was as a learning designer, I would take courses or um, online programming and I would embed um, uh, culturally relevant um, and uh, bridging, like uh, bridging technologies within the space, whether it was through the language or the activities or even through the information that was being shared. And I did so much amazing work. I would win a lot of awards for how, you know, things were set up, how things functioned um, and how, and the learning uh, that came out of it as well. So, so I became one of many, <laughs> which uh, a lot of people call, I say a cyborg and didn't know that there was like, I was part of an assemblage, like, I would come in and I plug in and then I plug out. And I was part of like this machine part ghost working within the system, within the academic space where the system would again, attempt to try to tell me. And what I found out as I went along the way, becoming more and more of a designer was that, that I was working in these third spaces that quite weren't, wasn't ready for my type of thinking. And in higher education, there's research that has been done uh, along the way of uh, like how these third spaces are created where all these dilemmas or these paradoxes and the dilemmas are happening because higher education wasn't created uh, for us, for people like me to kind of come in and help solve problems. So um, a part of my journey was that I really wanted to learn and unlearn and relearn a lot of things that uh, that was taught to me because I felt a lot of things that I were being I was being taught wasn't quite what my soul called for and it wasn't what the soul of other people were calling for as well even when I was working within the students um, they were sad they were depressed um, they didn't really believe what was being um, taught to them they were just kind of like going through the motions they just wanted to get a grade and also individuals as well as uh you know, working with a lot of faculty members, teaching them how to teach online. Um, they were pretty stifled. They were pretty barren and they were just kind of like being part of it. And so I felt like it was upon my, uh, it was part of my duty to learn and learn and relearn what I needed to do. And so what I will call myself is like an ex designer. Like I concentrate on human needs and I explore issues and like deep, like I try to find, what I do is I find the root causes and I attack um, those fundamental problems from many different areas, not just one. Um, and I don't just work alone because design by itself really isn't anything but a destructive force, but design, when I'm going within many different domains, it, pro it provides value to uh, uh, attempt to solve the solution rather than just like relieving the symptoms. So some people call me a systems designer. <laughs> Some people may call me a human-centered designer and some people may call me an experienced designer, but I do really do believe that I'm an ex-designer and I, and I help solve like social technical problems. Um, uh, but within the food space, I would call myself something different. I'm more of a community engaged scholar, a community engaged strategist and designer. Um, but when it comes to design, systems thinking is probably the most necessary skill for us to nurture in order of us to bring a full creative potential to social innovation and social impact. Let me move on. So let's talk about my design philosophy. Like, okay, like how do I look at design and how do I approach it? And I'll, I'll tell stories along the way. So I got my um, master's degree in integrative design from the University of Michigan, uh, Penny Stamp School of Design. MDES is a very specific type of program where we are very collaborative, empathetic, we look at complex issues, it's cross-disciplinary, um, and it's very, and, and I deal with very open-ended um, uh, situations and um, problems. Uh, a wicked problem is a social or cultural problem that's difficult or impossible to solve for many reasons, because it's, it's just that wicked. <laughs> um, it's, that's just how it is. It's, it's how it is because of many, many, many different reasons. And if we don't talk about the reasons why we get into these wicked, sticky spaces, because not, we're not really able to call them out. And I, you know, I always tell people wicked thoughts, wicked problems, 
wicked systems. Uh, one of the things when you're looking at design, uh, a lot of spaces when you're, when you're looking at like, is it design-led or expert-led? I'm more of like the participatory mindset in many different ways. I do a lot of generative uh, design research. Generative is just another, another word for creativity. Um, but depending on the project, I could go over here with expert design or use a centered design, but I mainly stay over here within this space um, of, of creating new things. I had to look at a variety and breadth of things to immerse myself in order for me to be able to look at this complex problem like it really is. And um, so I was very lucky, lucky to um, participate in the Food Access Project in Michigan. Um, what I learned was that researchers focused a lot on studying food access in low-income communities of color by examining its proximity to supermarkets and grocery stores. Not that they were looking at, well, there's other healthy ways that people sustain themselves. They only looked at it if it was in proximity to grocery stores. And they, the link lack of uh, supermarkets with consumption of unhealthy foods and poor health outcomes. Um, researchers often ignored the complexity, comple the deep complexity of food in communities of uh, color in a myriad of ways. Um, I was luckily um, chosen by Dr. Tosita Taylor. Um, she's an environmental sociologist. Um, she is very good at when it comes to the study of DEI and um, organizational structures. Um, she's also really deep in understanding about how toxic communities are um, approached. And so um, under her study, I learned a lot about what it means to have unequal access to food systems. Um, a lot of my other secondary research that I used um, was that of African fractal, sweet grass, the eloquence of the scribes, decolonizing methodology. I chose very specifically to only look at African and indigenous um, works um, within the space because if, because if I'm there to help um, amplify and galvanize change, I need to be able to utilize the tools of the people to be able to create that change. Um, some other research I did, I studied the Black academics, which is part of the National Black Food Justice Alliance. So I was doing a lot of reading, a lot of doing, and a lot of studying. <laughs> um, again, the eloquence of the scribes, um, he helped me um, come to a space of relearning, and I wanted to start with an African literature. And so he opened up his mind and his space. I'm so very thankful um, for him to make this book uh, because it helped guide me where at first I had no guides. And somehow books tend to like drop in my space some kind of way. Seriously, like literally, like if I need something and I don't know I need it, a book tends to come uh, along that path. Um, within that path, when I was studying literature, um, I started learning more about how myths was used as a cultural resource within my uh, community, within the African space and folklore. I used to love all the folklores that were that was read to me by my grandfather or my grandmother, um, but I started understanding about Yoruba in a little different way, and I started learning about the story of Ogun, who is who is like. Um, the father mother of creativity. And so I do believe within this fourth dimension where I'm choosing to venture out, where I create a, a tomorrow that did not exist yesterday. And I feel like through the story of Ogun, um, when we look at it, it's this space for the innovative soul, um, the type of person who lives to design new frames of life, um, the creative, the thinker, the artist and the scientist. And that's how I choose to do my work within this creative space, this creativity, um, the father and mother of creativity. Um, and so I go against the grain quite a bit, um, a lot because creativity isn't really looked at as a, a field or scope. Um, which naturally just happens specifically within ecology. A lot of my design research ad agenda is based upon self-determination. Um, so if you look at here, I'm here a lot when it comes to healing. I'm here a lot when it comes to decolonizing. I'm here a lot when it comes to transformation. I do believe as time goes on, 
I'll be here more mobilizing as well. But right now I'm operating within these uh, sectors. And a lot of the theories that I use again are like generative um, justice, creativity, interface and interaction and world making. So let's talk about design <laughs> as we see this image. Um, design was based upon um, the industrial revolution um, where we were evolving in many different ways when it, when it comes to economics and also when it comes to technology. But a lot of that um, has us looking at consumption in a very unhealthy way. And if you can see this picture and you see all these brands and you see the people, a lot of times it could be slop. Uh, a design again, a lot of times we design just for the meantime or whether that we need to buy more and more things, it's more consumption, more consumption, more consumption. It's not really geared towards actually creating things that go into a very natural cyclical uh, cycle. It's having us consume things that are harmful and having us break things um, along the way, especially when we look at enslavement um, and if enslavement is really gone away or not. Um, again, it has us focused on design from the 20th century, has us focused on products and services, never about our enlightenment as people or how we move within the community space. Um, because of that, the, the wicked thinking, the wicked problems, um, we're polluted everywhere. <laughs> Um, not just with plastic, but we were also polluted with some very demented minds um, as well. Um, we live in a world, I don't know if anybody ever saw this uh, movie called Alita uh, Battle Angel. It talks very specifically about consumption and AI, but you know, it's 40 tons of waste that's produced each ton, like all products, like all of this stuff goes somewhere and it becomes like destructive waste, um, not only for um, uh, us as human beings, but the environment as well as the animals and um, uh, we need, and we're interdependent upon one another. Here's another picture of like an actual landfill lap of like, you don't get any water, oxygen or light from these spaces. There's no microbes helping to break any of this stuff down. There's no life living and we're consuming this tons and tons every day. And so for me, when I come into a space from, a, when I come into any design space from an ecological perspective, I feel like we're all designers. We all have agency to make decisions however small, and it'll impact a group of people or environment. And every decision we make has an impact on equity. So for me, designers have to possess an ability to see the world through the eyes of others and to manifest new paths for them to follow. Before I begin, I want everybody to understand that race is a construct and race constantly constructs false narratives and data can sometimes be a distraction. And research can sometimes be a distraction. Being human is, is much more than just race, okay? That's a warning, all right? We have a current food system that is based upon exploitation from stolen land and stolen labor. The U.S. food system has been created and shaped by racial injustices since its inception, and racism is tied to a power structure and access, access to resources. Um, if we speak to um, the one and only uh, Miss Bell Hooks, um, ancestor, Ashe, uh, white supremacy, imperialism, capitalism, and patriarchy are interlocking systems of domination that define our current reality. Mm. And because of that, the enslavement and the sharecropping terror, the campaigns and the black land theft of black farmers and, um, for, um, and black people, black and brown people across the world, um, these attacks are on black sovereignty and have left us uh, particularly vulnerable to exploitation and injustice by a man-made uh, food system. Um, any system that produces what it was designed to produce. And I feel like sometimes we forget that systems are people, okay? All right, 
every so everything has become a matter of relational design and it's a focus on affect and a feeling all right if we look at the current food system, this is a, a food systems map. Um, you can see the intricate details of the interweaving of all of what we call the, the modern day food system. Um, a lot of white supremacy uh, narrative cultures are deeply embedded in what we know about food systems. If we look at individualism, paternalism, neoliberalism, if you hear these phrases, if they only knew. Vote with your fork. Communities can't take care of themselves. They're not listening. If we build it, they'll come. Pull yourselves up by the bootstrap. Let's focus on charity. These are many intersections of white supremacy within the food culture and how narratives um, uh, build the current systems that we are living in today when we look at food. Um, the food system today, if you look at this diagram, you can see all the extractive elements coming out. The consumer illness, the erasure of indigenous people, the farm exploitation, the pesticides, the nutrient density, density the carbon loss, the soil fertility, the air and water pollution, all of these are coming out of these farming practices um, that do not have African or indigenous um, ways of knowing embedded in them. A long-term goal for me, um, working, being a designer in the food system is being centered around community health and what that means and how we promote them, how things are informed by our community. Um, this is an ecosystem of general practices and institutions by the National Black Food Sovereignty Network. Um, what we would like to see um, is farming as medicine with farming practices in the soil and people um, where we're having the water retention go up, where we're having the soil biodiversity go up, where we're having indigenous sovereignty and farmers are becoming ecological stewards and nutrient dense. We want something that is a bit more reciprocal where we're not only, we're not, we're not extracting it, but we're taking care of it and we're giving back to it um, in a, a cyclical uh, way. Um, the problem where I feel like a lot of things happen is because there's a need for a more, uh, a worldview which emerges from like a culturally different frame of reference. Currently, if we look at the Euro-Americans, everything is based upon reactionary and then it becomes stereotypical. And then you have those that are assimilated, but those who have a cultural difference. And it's right here. This is a different cultural difference. The problem is we have different value systems and we're being taught within our educational systems that differences are bad. Like we all are the same, we're all equal. And that's not it. We just have different value systems and they need to be taught and understood. So, we'd be able, so we're a little bit able to work more, um, uh, more in harmony together instead of a disbalance. And as you can see, if you look at from the Eurocentric way, from the African centered way, the different dimensions of ourselves and how we look at time, the universe of death, they're very different. So that is why culture is so important and why we must study it, even from a very academic space when we're looking at the different groups um, and how we see issues or ideas. Um, our nature of reality is different. Our value orientation is just different. Our cosmology on how we, um, we have a relationship to divine, how we create systems of truth and generate knowledge. All these things are different for us, for different people. Why African and Native, Amer Native American roots for me? When I did my thesis, it was in Black Freedom Dream, Gender of Justice and Cultural Ecology as well as School Justice. It was at the center of that. Um, and it was many, many reasons why, <clears throat> because um, deeply embedded within the food system is this uh, idea of anti-Blackness, and it's all within global agribusiness and transnational corporations. And the reason why is because 
uh, the structures, they're often oppressive that we can't ignore and to treat them intersectionally and to consider how food is not separate from race, not separate from gender, not separate from ability. Um, and that where a person or community stands at these intersections mean they have radically different chances and access to food. Um, and so for me, I wanted to learn how to gather data from Black Indigenous perspectives. I still use um, forms of ethnography and focus groups and surveys when it comes to design research, but I wanted to uh, understand and value the forms of interaction and respect the communal connections that are often dis dismissed or suppressed in these hegemonic versions of design methods, research methods. And so I was drawn to look at what they call the three sisters. Um, some people call them four, some people call them nine. I believe it's really 12 where um, there's these interlocking uh, technologies of how you grow food and how um, the food uh, takes care of itself in the environment. Um, and it prevents value from being alienated and it's focused on these interdependent interlocking cycles. Um, you can see the same interlocking cycles within African tech uh, context, within the African technologies where um, we're creating Dinkra symbols. We use the bark from the tree, we boil the bark, we stain the bark, but we give it back to the tree. Instead of just ripping it away, we put it back into the earth, the byproducts of it, um, so it can grow um, in a different way. Um, you also can see that within African um, bee making, or art, or sweetgrass uh, baskets, um, this interlocking, this interwoven uh, way um, of being. You can also see it, um, even this beautiful picture, picture is called Foresight. Um, it was by uh, Leah Penniman. And this was um, a myth where um, some people believe it, some don't, where when we were being enslaved and we're being brought over, seeds were braided into the hair um of the grandchildren the grandbabies and we were able to create a life within that space but when all that enslavement was going on in the united states we failed to forget that all these things that we use now whether it's soil testing around the coast terraces the whole irrigation basil soil all these things were brought over all of these knowledge things were brought over because they weren't bringing just normal everyday people over here. They were bringing architects, they were bringing designers, they were bringing scientists uh, along the way. Um, again, if you look at traditional ecological agriculture, it's very generative. Um, well, it looks at unalienated labor and it takes pride in that. And it looks at the ecosystem from a very diverse perspective. And there's communalism and harvesting and healthy food ways and healthy living that circles and comes back, which isn't very present in uh, Western technologies. Um, you can also see it here. This is one of my grad product projects where I took um, uh, a cyclical space where I wanted to be regenerative and give back um, to a space. So um, this picture right here is what you call a, um, a African futurist greenhouse. Um, I built like a prototype right here in the lab and I was growing what you call Job's Tears, um, which is a grassy-like uh, bead plant where um, the seeds are actually like beads. And so I was working with a community project, which was the uh, African uh, Bead Museum in the city of Detroit, where they're actually building the African futurist now, greenhouse now. And I've showed him how to grow the Job's Tears so he's able to make his own beads out his backyard. Um, so it's easy to see how all this stuff can be happening in African futurist greenhouses, but what does that look like in black and brown communities? Um, and so I'm here to talk a little bit about like my approach within cultural ecology because it's about like a cultural realignment. It's a shift from individualism and selfishness to more of like collective worth and mutual responsibility. Um, cultural ecology is based upon uh, three um, states of mind, it's about character refinement, cognitive restructuring, and cultural alignment, because within cultural ecology, it's recognized that the person and the environment must be understood, and that relationship between the person and the environment 
cannot be understood without the absence, um, without the absence of cultural meaning. So culture is extremely important in the work that we do. Um, as a designer, I artfully weave in cultural values on every project that I work on. Um, I do that because I feel like I have a responsibility um, to use, to bring to life um, and to build uh, new tools that are centered on uh, creating healthy environments for everyone. Um, so it's very important for me when I'm working within social innovation or social impact, um, where I'm grounding our change into in, in, in this change and anchoring into these building blocks that will last within the future and not just for the present day. And so what you see when I'm working is that I'm going from this one reality to this like new future and it's like this creative tension that happens that a lot of people don't like to be in, but we need that creative tension to get to the new future. So one thing I like to share with you is one community engaged research project. And when I uh, say community engaged, that means that I'm more of like a practitioner that works in close, close partnership with people from underrepresented or under-resourced communities uh, to develop the ideas that address the most present issues. And one is the Washington County Black Farmers Fund. Um, the Washtenaw County Black Farmers Fund was created from the, uh, the county of Washtenaw within uh, the state of Michigan, and they're taking actions to build a more equitable food system. Um, when I came to this work, um, the Washtenaw Food Policy Council approached me and was saying like, hey, we need to build space for Black farmers. We want to do a fund. How do we do it? So it wasn't just about campaigning. It was also about strategy and deeply embedding um, healing technologies within the space. And so when I look at the equity and access work we were doing, we were looking at resources, which was the land. We was looking at power, which is relationship building. And then we was looking at the dignity of the individuals and we shaped that around the communications. Uh, we had a very tight timeline with grant funding and we had a, like a lot of things to get done um, in a short amount of time. Um, what I did was I took six members who actually participated in a DNI learning cohort. I looked at the grant goals and I was like, okay, here's some plans of action that we can do to amplify this work. Um, and so what we did was we did some community engagement and some assessment. assessment. Um, we did racial equity design research and training. Uh, I put, I put the whole council I put the whole council through some uh, racism training. So they had the same language when they were working with one another. They had a firm understanding and grounding of the inequities that many of us didn't get a chance to learn about in school. Um, then I start doing like a social change ecosystem and mapping everybody's roles out on um, where they wanted to work. And then we did a community uh, table of collaboration because we wanted to engage in co-creation with other people as we moved along. Uh, we also did like a survey for idea tool collection, but for everyone got together and we were hearing different things of like land access and capital for current aspiring BIPOC farmers. That's something we need to address, land reparations. And they like to actually have the makeup of the council be much different. Um, and again, we sent them through what you call Soul Fire Farm, Uprooting Racism in the Food System Training, which is a theory action workshop for environmental and food justice leaders. People can take this individually as well, but we went through as a group. Um, within that goal, we also, I, I, I pivoted and I created like a map of like how many different organizations uh, participated as well as the community members. Um, and what you see now, <laughs> is um, these are all the community partners um, that I tend to uh, work with. But, um, and here's our, some of the organizational partners uh, that I tend to work with, but with the Black Farmers Fund, um, we have a, a huge coalition of people based upon the research, the, the community engaged design research. We found many people who wanted to work within this space. Um, we set out for a goal of $50,000, but we ended up raising over $150,000 and we're giving it out today. And we're having our first cohort uh, come out uh, next month. 
Um, here's a community engaged design project. Um, this is we the people. The framework is centered within like a soil assessment, which is an assessment that I have created. It has resource identification and the soil management plan for them to follow while they're going through the cultural ecology of like changing their cognitive space and being more in depth within what culture is. And the farm interns creates this journey map based upon the experiences that they go through with me as their teacher and also utilizing a lot of farm um, program resources such as financial management, uh, uh, mental health, uh, community service with Habitat for Humanity, uh, Michigan Works. Um, they take full responsibility of their soil management plan because they're there to change their soil. Cultural ecology is really about, it's an um, African-American framework um, of uh, moving from one reality to the next. It's about character refinement, cognitive restructuring, cultural realignment. Um, and for me, I feel like the work that I do, these are just like snapshots of some of the work that I do, but each generation must out of relative obscurity discover its mission, fulfill it or betray it. I feel like I'm fulfilling mine and I refuse to betray anything. <laughs> and um, uh, because of that, I have this um, very rich design process um, that is based upon um, uh, African cosmology of the Bantu Congo, where you're looking at the explicit world and the tacit world, and you go through these different spaces when you're working with community. Um, and I feel like it's beneficial and it's not harmful and it creates um, the necessary things that's needed in order to create a new reality. And that was my discussion <laughs> for today. <laughs> if you want to follow me, please, you can follow me at my email address or my Instagram and I also have a LinkedIn account. <laughs>